Okay, so Byzantine. Um, we're actually going a little bit out of we're going a little bit out of order. If you look at the posters. Yeah. Uh, the, we should go medieval times, right? Yeah. yeah. But the reason why the reason why we're doing this a little bit out of order is because there is a direct connection between what we've already studied in terms of uh, Christian art and the fall of Rome and the flow right into the Byzantine Empire. Now, one of the things you have to understand about Byzantine art is that it's one of the most static, meaning unchanging, kind of um, styles of art in that we're going to study, at least after 80, right? At least after, after the Christian period. Greek art, or uh, sorry, uh, Egyptian art lasted about 3,000 years. Not a lot of changes, we know that. But Byzantine art kind of gives it a run for its money. Um, a lot of the Byzantine art that we're going to be looking at doesn't change basically from the period that we're looking at starting in about the 500s all the way up till the 1400s. And even some Byzantine art that still is done today, that's still produced today, follows the exact same characteristics. So we see here on our timeline, we have early Byzantine and iconoclastic period, and then middle Byzantine. We're going to be looking at those first two periods today. So early Byzantine and then iconoclastic period. All right, so what happened? Yeah. Yes. So we have the Edict of Milan. We know that that set up Christianity as the religion of the empire. We talked about during the fall of Rome and the end of the Roman Empire, how Constantine shifted the capital of Rome to the city of what used to be Byzantium and now is called Constantinople. But Byzantium is still going to be considered um, the, the name of this whole area. And so what we're talking about really is the area in modern day Turkey, modern day Constantinople, and then all down into basically uh, the rest of the Eastern church. And there are some really specific characteristics about it. So early Byzantine art, there are some specific characteristics. There, this is a move away of, from the naturalism of the classical tradition. So classical, capital C. So Roman Greek art towards a more abstract and a more universal way of depicting people. There's still some naturalism there, but the figures are going to be stiff. They're going to be very, the whole idea behind a lot of these uh, paintings, these depictions, these icons, as they're called, are, it's going to be devotional. That's the purpose for these. And so it's not meant to really convey beauty. It's meant as, an, as a help towards devotion. You're meant to be able to communicate with the divine when you're looking at these images, right? So is it still art? Yes, it's still art. It fits all the characteristics of art, but it's very distinct, right? There's not a lot of artistic license in the works. Ironically, some of the earliest works have a lot more artistic license than some of the later works, but we're going to see why that progresses. Yeah? The crucifix we have in the chapel, is that Byzantine art? No, that's Franciscan. Oh. That's the crucifix of St. Francis. So there's a definite preference for two-dimensional representation. It's not three-dimensional, right? There's not a lot of weight. There's not a lot of perspective. Why? Because the figures are what's more important. The people that are uh, depicted are what's more important. I feel okay. like there's a lot of Byzantine art in our little chapel at school. Mm -hmm. There's it's a lot. There's a lot of influence in that. Yeah. Um, artworks which contain a religious message predominate. There's not a lot of pastoral scenes like we've seen in Rome. There's not a lot of figures of emperors. If there are figures of emperors, we're going to look at that next class, then they're going to be placed into a religious context. And we're going to look at that uh, a lot more later. They used bright stones, gold mosaics, lively wall paintings, intricately carved ivory, a lot of precious metals. Mm -hmm. It's an ivory case. A color tusk. And the, the greatest, the greatest and most lasting legacy is the icons. So, what is an icon? We're going to be looking at that a little bit more here in a second. But an icon is basically a religious artwork, 
and it's specifically in an Eastern religious artwork. Okay, and there are certain characteristics about it which we're going to look at here in a little bit. Yeah. Out? You just carve it like anything else. Difference? Yeah. Is it is it hollow or carve? No. Yeah, the case is hollow. But Wait, no, no. but a tusk is a tusk is big. Yeah, I know, but it's not hollow. No. Huh. So, what influences what influences Byzantine art? Two things are really going to influence Byzantine art. There's going to be the influence from Rome, which is less of an influence. More of the influence is going to come from the Greeks. Okay, more of the influence is going to come from the Greeks. This more um, this more natural way of, of depicting things. But they're going to kind of take a step backwards, right? It's, what's the difference between, what, what was the thing that really set, a, set apart Greek art, Greek, Greek depictions of people? Um, they were trying, to, right. yeah. trying, to, trying to portray the perfect person. They're not going to care so much about that here, right? So they're going to take some aspects of Greek art, but again, they're not trying to depict the perfect person. Their, pur their purpose is to depict um, sanctity or holy people. And it's supposed to be a, a, a reference or a way for people to, uh, to meditate or to pray. So the Greeks influenced the Byzantine era? Mm -hmm. So even though it's a thousand years later, it still has... Still has Greek influence. Greek influence. Yep. It's yep. It's got the juice. Well, and if you look at the geography, it makes sense. Constantinople is, is pretty close to Greece, right? It's, it's right there. Yeah, and, but you think like a thousand years. Yeah, so but that's how, important the Greek, that's how important the Greek, Greek art was to culture. Even still today, we have influence of Greek art, right? Um, at the same time, geographical, the geographical extent of the empire also had implications for art, Okay. We're going to see different, slightly different characteristics in different areas in Byzantine art. So this is a book of the Gospels. This is called the Rabula, Rabula Gospels. We're going to look at that in more detail later. Uh, these are a book of the Gospels, and they were illuminated, meaning painted. Each page was individually painted. And it's going to take a lot of Eastern influences, mm -hmm. right? You're going to see influences from India. You're going to see influences from the Far East coming into play here in these Book of Gospels from Syria. A lot of, What's I mean, those, birds mean? Those, peacocks? those are peacocks again. What's that? Here? Yeah, I'm not sure what those are. <laughs> but you see a lot of Eastern influences. We still call this Byzantine art because it was still produced in the area. Okay. Uh, let me skip or okay okay so half tone colors so half tone colors meaning shading there's not going to be a lot of shading in these in these depictions right it's go except except for in the faces all the all the garments all of the you know even these folds these are not made with shading these are made with you know cross hatching right these bright colors that are kind of layered on top of one another. It all gives this very two-dimensional aspect of it. It's not going to be very uh, robust, very three-dimensional. But again, they didn't really care. Uh, Antioch and Syria. Let's go back to that real quick. Oops. Antioch and Syria are going to have this orientalizing style. The tree of life, ram's heads, double-winged creatures. Right. These are all from Syria. So we have this mix of Greek art, we have this mix of Far Eastern art, and it's all going to kind of coalesce into this Byzantine style. Um, why do uh, like Japanese, Chinese, like Eastern um, houses have those like curls at the ends? Like, Not sure. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. Um, and so this is going to, you know, once it's really set up, once it's once we have this this original style, then that, this is going to become the predominant style of, of the era, of the area. All right, so what are icons? Icons are paintings of Jesus or another holy figure, typically in a traditional style, typically on wood. 
And these are venerated used as an aid to devotion in the Byzantine and other Eastern churches. You have to understand in the East, they had a great deal of respect for the icons. It's kind of hard for us to understand as, as Western Catholics, as Roman Catholics, uh, but when we see a, a picture of Our Lady or we see a picture of Christ there in the back of the, of the room, we don't really venerate it as such. It's used as an aid to devotion. But the East, I don't want to say that they worshipped icons, because they didn't. But they placed a lot more importance on the icons. It was seen as a representation of that person in a more uh, real way than we see our depictions in the in the Western Church. Yeah. Depending on the painting, does like the ethnicity of like the paintings change? Because like, are they able to look different from the Lady of Lords? Yeah, like absolutely. Yeah, there's going to be you know people are always going to want to depict <laughs> religious figures in ways that are representational to them, and and in fact, when Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego, she appeared as a Mexican maiden. She would do that on purpose. And so that's, that's common. Uh, in the apparitions of Our Lady of Akita, she appeared as a Japanese woman, right? She wants to portray herself as a mother to all people. And so, yeah, that, that absolutely happens. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that once we get into the Renaissance too. Do they usually like, depict the like, body parts darker than like, the background? Yeah, so this, so on a lot of icons, what they're going to do, because the icons are so precious, what they would do is they would cover the icons with silver or gold or some sort of metallic plating. And so that's what you're seeing here. This is all metallic plating. And then there's a cutout here of the figure. So they would paint the icon, and then they would place this, this precious stone or precious metal on top of it. And that's, again, fairly common as well. Um, Icons are, often, are most often seen in mosaics, wall paintings, small artworks made from wood, metal, gemstones, enamel, ivory. So they would use all sorts of materials for it. The most common form, again, are these small painted wood panels, which could be carried or hung on walls. Okay, so this is a more modern one, but you can still see it has a lot of the same characteristics. So it's like a, just like a picture then? It's, it's a picture. But it's painted. It's painted. Mm -hmm. So it would be like, how big would a picture? They usually they're pretty small. Usually they're about this big. Oh, so it's like actually like a picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some panels were painted. Some were done with encaustic. That first one that we looked at. Let me go back again. This first one. This is encaustic, which we're going to learn about here in a second. We'll learn about that here in a second. Um, so what do we see? We, what do we see as far as characteristics? Not background, not a lot of background, not a lot of three-dimensionality. They're not really trying to portray a scene. Again, the figures are what is most important. Okay? And then there's usually some sort of text on the icon itself, telling what the icon is, or using some sort of a religious symbol, saying, this is what the icon is. This is who is, who is here. Wait, who's Jesus holding? We are here. We are here. Uh, this. Um, oh, sorry. So this is this is one that's called the Dormition of, of Our Lady. This is the death of Our Lady. In the East, they call it the Dormition or the Sleep of Our Lady. Um, and so this is Christ holding her as an infant. Okay. Wait, but Our Lady Gentiles? Debated. We don't know. In the West, we say she died. In the East, they say she didn't. Doesn't matter. She assumed it into heaven, yes, oh. and she's there. But did she die or not? In the West, it's it's a theological debate. In the West, they say, well, if Christ died, then his mother should have died. In the East, we don't have like, any proof as to why she died. No, she's she and it's we and it's not a some, yeah. It's not a matter of faith, right? It's not a matter of faith whether or not she died. It's a matter of faith that she's in heaven. Yeah. But it's not a matter of faith whether the, or not she died. The West, like when you say they, what they say that she died because she because died. Christ died. Yeah. So they don't have like. How does it matter of faith that she's in heaven? We already know she has to be in heaven because she was born without a Right. It's a matter of, right. That's it. But she was assumed body and soul into heaven. Yeah. Right? That's a matter so of faith. So why, is it, why do we can't fully believe, believe that she's in heaven? heaven? We do they fully can't believe. believe that she's died, that she died. What? It doesn't matter whether or not she, she died or whether she just went to sleep. Yeah. She assumed. It doesn't matter. Oh, that's the... <laughs> that's, that's the distinction. Okay. All right. So, in caustic... Short video about what encaustic is. Looks like 
Is your clock like levitating? I don't know. Levitate back up. Lush. I like mixed. It looks like lush soap. Lush. I love lush. What's lush? Caustic is basically using wax to paint with, so different colors of wax to paint with. And obviously you have to work pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like cooking, isn't it, really? that we looked at of Our Lady, that was painted in caustic. That was fairly common. Um, not all of them were done that way. A lot of it was just paint on wood. The fluidity of the medium allows me so many different possibilities. Okay, so that's... All right, so the, kind of the, the depiction of the depiction of our Lord here, this is called in the East the Pantocrator, right? So this is a title that they gave to our Lord. Um, he's holding a gospel book in his left hand, and he's performing a blessing with his right hand. Who is that? This is Christ. And this was a painting that was likely donated by Justinian I, and we still have it today. Um, this is an important image because this original image was copied over and over and over again. This is kind of the OG image of, of, of our Lord here. Um, many people think that this is actually the most realistic depiction of our Lord that we have. Because why? Because this was painted based on the shroud. So they used the shroud to paint this. What the one we learned last year was like, was it? Did he like paint it with like snow? That's not what I expected at all. Was it like an orb with like the world? Yeah, that's... Oh yeah, that was Michelangelo. Was it? Oh, that was like Dolly or something. Oh no, that was Da Vinci. Is that the one that they like... That was the one that they tried to restore and then over... Is that the one that they recently found out was Da Vinci? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It looks kind of dark to me. All right, so we're going to look at this... He's got the hair. We're going to look at this image. Please play. Yes. There we go. Yes, it's too one. <laughs> In fifth century Istanbul, or Constantinople as it was known then, there were no televisions, tablets, or even photographs. There were very few man-made images in the world. So looking at pictures, mosaics, and statues in a church would be a very emotional and traumatic experience. Worshippers would kneel and kiss these objects, and they were seen as a conduit or path to Christ, Mary, or the saints. The objects you are seeing are called icons, after the Greek word for likeness, image, or portrait. A particular form of icon like. was called a pantocrator, a word deriving from the Greek meaning all-powerful or ruler of the world. This particular icon was found in St. Catherine's Mon Monastery in Sinai, in the middle of the desert. The only reason, probably, that it actually survived was because it was in such a desolate place. And it was only discovered in the 1950s. Imagine you are a 5th century worshipper in a church in Constantinople and looking into those eyes must have been quite an experience. This is the figure of a bearded Jesus Christ. 
he looks at you with a delicate right hand which is raised in a blessing and he carries a richly ornamented book of the Gospels in his left hand. There are some other elements. Firstly, the halo is quite large and made of gold. Secondly, there are buildings at the back suggesting that he is in the open air, uh, possibly giving a sermon. On the top left and right corners, there are stars which are eight pointed and might refer to the eighth day when Christ was resurrected. And finally, yeah. I want to show that this icon does seem to be in two halves. And if we separate the face, we find that there are two people here. One young, spiritual, and the other very mature and powerful. This displays a belief of the early church of the dual nature of Christ, both divine and human. Okay, so I don't necessarily agree with his analysis on that part of it. Um, what, the splitting thing? The, the split, the dual side of things. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Um, I think what, what makes this image important for us is, like I mentioned earlier, this was, from, from all accounts, if you, and, and I didn't do this, uh, I'll, I'll show you in one of our other classes. Um, if you look at the Shroud of Turin and you overlay the shroud on top of this image, it's almost an identical match. Um, why are the eyes like that? Why are the eyes sunken in like that? Uh, well, because the shroud was a death mask, essentially. Uh, it showed Christ after his sufferings. Why is the left eye bigger than the right eye? Swollen. Well, because it's swollen. Because he was hit. He was, you know, the, the scriptures say he was buffeted, right? He was, he was hit by the soldiers, right? There's another image of the Pantocrator that's produced just a little bit later, just like 100 years later, that is uh, even a closer match with the Shroud. We can go into the whole history of the Shroud. We, we don't have the time to do that uh, today. Maybe we will a little bit later. Um, but the Shroud was in existence during this time. They did know where it was, in fact, but they didn't call it the Shroud. The Shroud was, in fact, folded up. So we had this long strip of cloth that was folded up uh, that was, you know, it shows the, the front and the back of back of our Lord, but they folded it up and they <coughs> basically left it so that just the face was exposed. And that was used as in, in veneration in, in various places. But, but you can kind of like see a line where like the two sides separate. Yeah, and but it does match it does match the shroud. The side of his face, according to the shroud, was swollen because of because of all the abuse that he suffered. So uh, that's my thought. I you know he could be right in terms of the dual you know. The dual nature, I, I don't know. We, we don't really know what the, what the idea was. All right, so we're going to look briefly at iconoclasm. I think we have a few minutes. I'm not sure exactly when this class is over, but we're going to look briefly at iconoclasm. Iconoclasm was this movement, and iconoclasm, generally speaking, means any destruction of, of religious images. So we can say iconoclasm happened in, during this period. We can say iconoclasm happened during the Protestant Re Reformation. Um, iconoclasm is any, de uh, any destruction of religious images. Um, but this is where it all comes from. Um, people were called iconoclasts, which is Greek for breakers of images. And this was a huge movement. The first movement happened from about 726 to 787. Well, why? Because a lot of the early Christians uh, at this time, they thought that the devotion towards these icons was getting too much, was over the top. And they said, hey, people are starting to actually worship these icons and we can't do that. That's against the second commandment. So what was their solution? Their solution was not educate the people and tell them that's not what you're supposed to do. Their solution was get rid of all the icons. And so we have this, we have this, um, this movement that lasted uh, about 140 years, or sorry, about 60 years, um, where all of the images in, as many images as people could find, 
were destroyed. So we have these beautiful mosaics in some of these older churches that were just simply destroyed and covered over. And now instead we have just very austere images and decoration, similar to what we've seen with Jewish art and similar to what we'll see with, uh, with Islamic art later. So um, they thought that the pictures were being adored and stuff. Right. Don't Right. But again, remember I said the East had more of an emphasis on these images. So icons, even today, if you go to, uh, if you go to a uh, East, Eastern Greek Catholic church or you go to one of their divine liturgies, uh, they will process with an icon and that will be incensed and that will be rever reverenced. So they had more of an emphasis on the images than we do in the West. And so that's why there was this kind of pushback. It wasn't. No, it's not. And it's still not wrong today. Uh, but this was an overreach, right? And so a lot of the images were destroyed. People have been able to restore a lot of them. How do we still have the Pantocrator? That was created earlier. Well, it was hidden away in a monastery, and we didn't see it. We, you know, they didn't find it. Going back to where they found the Edom, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was like a, no one was in that monastery. It's just right. It was abandoned for a while, for a long time. That's crazy. Okay. That's crazy. So, um, anyway, you can read. You can read through what it says. Byzantine iconoclasm was started by a ban on religious images by the emperor, and then another emperor came back and said, "No, let's restore them." And then there was a second iconoclast period uh, that lasted about another thirty years. <coughs> and so it went back and forth, um, but a lot of them were, um, a lot of them were brought back. Justinian I, he was a ruler between 527 and 565. He ushers in kind of what we consider the second or the third period of of Byzantine art. So the first period is is early Byzantine. The second period is the iconoclastic period, and then we move into the reign of Justinian I. And we're going to talk more about these two buildings. Uh, next class. Uh, this one is called the Hagia Sophia. This was a church in Constantinople. Um, today is, it is a mosque, um, but well, he I'm built this. What the, um, what some on the yep. But, but he built this church, and we're going to go more into the history of that here in a little bit. So he also had this built. Oh my. This is St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. This is one of the old, this is where they found the, the Pantocrator. Um, this was, this is the oldest monastery. This is the oldest, um, yeah, monastery in existence still well, today. St. Catherine's Monastery? St. Catherine's well, Monastery. Uh, there are a, a few still today. Yep. So we're going to look more at the, at the work of Justinian and what he did. Um, he was very influential. He was a temporal ruler, but he was very much Christian, very much uh, influential. And so we're going to look at that next time. And so I'm just going to end here because I don't know when class ends. So. Okay, he said, are we going over the hockey